Welcome, everyone. Thanks for sticking out before lunch. My name is Alexis Ruz. I'm director of machine learning at Salesforce in a sales cloud activity platform team. And along with Wen Hao, uh, we are going to discuss how we have built a text classifier uh, using uh, Spark and TensorFlow. I will first quickly introduce Salesforce and give you an overview of the problem we are solving. I will then introduce deep learning and explain why it is a fit for our problem. Wen Hao will then drill into the model architecture and how TensorFrame and Spark DL allows us to use TensorFlow uh, with Spark. Uh, finally, uh, Wen Hao will do a demo in a notebook and we'll wrap up. This presentation will cover some future developments and Salesforce being a publicly uh, traded company, I have to remind you to only make purchasing decisions on products that are commercially available today. That's it for the disclaimer. Uh, Salesforce offers a comprehensive customer success platform allowing us to uh, deliver a unique uh, user experience. Uh, we have been called Innovator of the Decade last year and named one of Fortune best place to work nine years in a row. We are one of the top five uh, grass, uh, fast growth uh, company. Uh, we have 10 billion of revenue for FY18, and it is thanks to our customers and partners that we could achieve this success. Our customer success platform is the one number one CRM and cover a spectrum of interactions for marketing, sales, service, and more. And over the last few years, we have embarked in adding AI right into our platform in all our applications. Uh, using the customer data we have and uh, essentially uh, the deep understanding of uh, uh, machine learning, we are making all of our, our Salesforce applications smarter. And today, I'm specifically going to discuss what we're doing in Sales Cloud uh, related to activity data and specifically what we do around email text classification. So let's first quickly uh, describe our problem space. So we have built a platform to generate intelligence based on communication data, such as email, meetings, tasks, phone calls, and so forth, to make Salesforce applications smarter. Automated activity captures allows us to capture and federate all activities for users or across users working on an opportunity. And we have been working on extracting relevant insights from emails, such as pricing discussed, scaling requests, executive involved, competition mentioned, and so forth, and surfacing them into AI inbox and says cloud UI. This allows our user to stay on top of what matters, which is, for instance, identifying a pricing discussion from a new prospect or an important customer. In addition to surfacing insights, we suggest what actions our user should take next, and we track direct and indirect feedback from our users to keep improving the experience. Sales Cloud products are targeted at sales users. Uh, so the sales people receive a wide variety of emails, and they have to quickly sort out and act upon uh, on some of those emails in a timely fashion. And some of those emails are really very relevant, while others are not. The model we're going to discuss is about scaling a request. For instance, we can see on the left an email that is a scaling request, while the other two are not. We want to be able to detect this type of email and surface that to the user immediately, along with a recommended action. But before scoring emails, we have to first filter emails to limit emails to human-generated ones or out-of-organization emails, for instance. And second, we have also to parse email into their main components, so we can only score based on the relevant text body part and not based on the reply chain or signature, for instance. And typically, NLP text classifier will solve that problem by following a sequence of steps, normalizing and tokenizing the text, generating engrams, removing stop words, computing the temp frequency, computing the inverse document uh, frequency, and filtering the engrams based on some IDF threshold. And this approach works, however, it has a few drawbacks. The lack of generalization as the classifier is limited to vocabulary from the training data. Uh, this is a problem as languages are rich and there are lots of ways to express the same intent. For instance, a scheduling request. And the collection of engrams doesn't allow for engrams ordering or sequences. And sequences matter on text and scoring an order, an order set of engrams isn't optimal as long emails mean more engrams, hence more noise. 
So in the previous slide, we discussed how engrams suffer from lack of generalization. This is where word to vec or glove fit in. They allow to create a vector representation for words using unsupervised learning on a corpus of text. You can train your own model on your own corpus or use pre-trained models. And word vectors allow to capture semantics for individual tokens, and it is possible to use them to aggregate sentences, paragraphs, or even documents to generate new features that can be used by machine learning models. We will show later how word vectors can be used with recurrent neural networks models. The vector representation also allows interesting properties, such as reasoning through vector composition, as illustrated by the example on the bottom right. They also allow to find synonyms, as we can see on the example at the bottom left, where we train a word to vec on a corpus of email, and we're looking at the top five synonyms for the work cost. Uh, you can see money at the top, as in that case, we standardize in the monetary amounts. In the past, we've been using the following architecture for some of our classifiers. In our living it, there for a reference, to contrast on the deep learning architecture we will be describing next. In the above, you can see that we've complemented engrams and use also word to vec and LDA to enhance our models with global corpus knowledge using unsupervised learning. So now let's move on to deep learning. So neural networks are based on a loose brain inspiration. They model a structure of cells composing layers where each cell is a classifier and the activation of each layer is passed onto the next. You can see on the left a cell uh, where X is an input example, W are the weights, that filter inputs, and A is the activation of the hidden layer, uh, which results in running the classifier and the activation function. To the right, we can see a simple feed for one network with a single hidden layer. The input represents features, while the output represents a label class in an unsupervised learning, such as scaling request. In a feed for one network, information is fed straight through. That is, it never touches nodes twice. Uh, there are a number of ways cell can be composed to create neural networks. Deep learning refers to the size of the network, which for a feed-forward network will essentially mean uh, at least one hidden layer. And the feed-forward network do not support the notion of time and have no memory. Recurring neural networks allows a signal to propagate through a layer more than once. A recurring neural network can be thought of as multiple copies of the same network, each passing a message to a successor. The RNN takes as their input not just the current time, but also what has been processed in the past. The decision of a recurring uh, neural network reached at time minus one affects the decision it will reach at time in a T. So recurring networks have two sources of inputs, the present and the recent past, which are combined to determine how they respond to new data. They allow to extract information from the sequence as they allow to preserve sequential information in the recurrent network's hidden state. For email classification, the sequence will represent the sequence of words or tokens for the email. And using RNN allows us to find correlation between event in times, and those correlations are called long-term dependencies because an event depends upon and is function of more events that came before. For instance, considering trying to predict the last word in the text, I grew up in France, I speak French, French. You can see that the context matters here. And RNN essentially extends NN and your networks by extending uh, back propagation uh, through time. One last consideration is that the input data for a fit for one network is 2D. Uh, the data has n rows or examples, where each row consists of m columns. Uh, the data for RNNs are time series, thus they have three dimensions. One additional dimension for time, as Wen Ho will show in the model. And our model needs to process a sequence of word or tokens, where previous tokens might matter, but neural network, including recurring, are not good at dealing with long sequences due to vanishing or expanding gradients. It is hard to know how much impotence to accord to remote inputs. It is because the layers and time steps of the deep neural networks relate to each other through multiplication. And thus, derivatives are susceptible to vanishing or expanding gradients. The long, uh, short uh, term, you know, network or LSTM are capable of learning long-term dependencies. 
the LSTM cells are designed to be chained into a recurring network, and they allow to store and use memory across the sequence. So instead of a single neural network layer, LSTM are four interacting in a very special way. Getting in depth will require a talk of its own, and I'm leaking at the bottom a blog uh, detailing how they operate and where those diagrams are for, but to keep it high level, LSTM units contain information outside the normal flow of the curricular network in a gated cell. The LSTM does have the ability to remove or add information to the cell state, carefully regulated by structures called gates. Those gates act on signal they receive, and similar to neural network nodes, they can block or pass information based on the strengths of the weights, which are adjusted via a recurring network learning. That is, the cell learn when to allow data to enter, leave, or be deleted through the iterative process of guessing, doing back-propagating error, and adjusting weights via gradient descent. Each LSTM unit makes decisions by considering the current input, the previous input, and the previous memory, and generate a new output and alters its memory. And the LSTM units are designed to be chained into a recurring network and thus solo to store and use memory across a sequence. And now I will have Weno diving into the model architecture and explain how we implemented the model. My name is Wen Hao. I work for uh, Alexis, uh, who uh, just talked to you. So uh, model architecture. So um, we basically, the point of the whole introduction is to uh, sort of uh, give you a flavor uh, um, of the kind of things where we will be talking about. A lot of you may already be very familiar with uh, um, basic uh, recurrent neural network or uh, LSTM. So I'm just going to describe a pretty simple um, architecture that we use to uh, do text classification. So there are many, many design choices you can make uh, when you create your own recurrent neural network. Um, and in this talk, I'm, I'm just going to try to cover a few basic uh, popular building blocks. So from the bottom to top, uh, the network we're going to introduce essentially has three layers. The bottom layer is the uh, embedding layer or the input layer, where it this layer turn, turns tokens, like words, in a body of text into word embeddings. And uh, in, in our case, we use uh, globe vectors to represent uh, the, to the tokens in the text. The second layer is, the, is a uh, bidirectional bidire recurrent neural network. Um, bidirectional because we have two directions. One is forward and one is backward. They, they read the sequence, uh, the, the documents, both forward and backward. And uh, they have LSTM units as their cells. The third layer is sort of the output layer, the soft max layer, whatever you want to call that. And in some cases, you could add, uh, in this diagram, we are taking the last output uh, from both directions, forward and backward, uh, and take those outputs uh, to feed into the sigmoid unit, units. However, you could also do pooling uh, across time that sometimes improve your performance, sometimes does not. Um, so it's really a highly empirical question there. Um, so whenever you talk about a neural network, the problem overfitting is always there. It's kind of this uh, thing that people already get tired of talking about. So I'm just going to quickly talk through what kind of regularization we did to prevent overfitting. Um, sorry, not prevent, mitigate, because in the end, we still have overfit. Um, to some extent. So you could do early stop. Um, you can set the series to run, I don't know, 50,000 epochs. But in the end, you can stop at 2,000 or 20,000. Uh, the second thing you can do is do, do uh, regularization. You basically add a different regularization term to the objective function. Or you do dropout. In our case, we did dropout, uh, variational dropout, 
Uh, this is a paper published by Gao and uh, um, uh, Garamani in 2016, I think. Um, so this idea is, is that we do drop pods on both input layer and recurrent layer, and as well as the um, output layer, so that um, basically the idea is that you introduce some random perturbation so that your units don't overemphasize some of the tokens or some of the entries in the vector. And uh, this is pretty handy. So there, uh, in TensorFlow, there's a function you can call that'll return all of the trainable variables. Um, this is a very brutal way to do reg regularization because it essentially treats every uh, parameter in your uh, network as the same. So you probably should uh, tweak in terms of which, uh, how much you want to regularize, regularize and, and how you would like to regularize. But this is a starting point. So we deal with email data and it's really diverse. Uh, the length of an email can go from zero sometimes, or one, like thanks, or sometimes it's a long essay. Uh, we've all been there. So in our case, in order to make sure we don't uh, get bogged down by really long or ill-behaved uh, email, we have a maximum length, uh, sequence length imposed on it. And we also uh, try to, and another problem of uh, email is that, like I mentioned earlier, you have different lengths for each email. So what you want to do, uh, in addition to padding, uh, you want to use the dynamic RN, which kind of automatically stops uh, the training process once it finished reading the whole sequence. And this is really important because uh, when you do padding, you think, oh, I'm doing adding meaningless tokens like zeros to uh, my, my, my documents, and it shouldn't be a problem. But the problem with that is that if you don't stop once you finish the real text, you're going to keep on reading a bunch of zeros. And as powerful as uh, LSTM is, it sometimes will just wipe out the whole thing you already read. So dynamic RN, that's your friend. And we dreamed up with all kinds of crazy architecture here. This is just a list. Um, you can go as crazy as you, you would like. And we kind of went crazy at some point. I did. Um, so the whole point of this talk is sort of to talk about how we uh, put everything together um, into our production environment. Alexis covered our traditional uh, ML pipeline in production already. Uh, the point here is that um, we do tokenization, pre-processing, all everything in Scala and Spark. So what I'm gonna do is to replace this part of the pipeline, the scoring or the training pipeline with TensorFlow. Again, this is a really nice visualization for um, LSTM by uh, Shi Yan. Check out his blog. Um, so how do we do that? Because we're really talking about making two frameworks and two languages talking to each other. The way to do it is, uh, well, this is kind of another visualization of um, what Alexis mentioned earlier. You st instead of having a 2D input into your network, now you have 3D with one of the dimensions being time. So the trick of um, fixing, uh, fitting a uh, TensorFlow model into, uh, into your Spark uh, ML, sorry, Spark and slash Scala um, pipeline is to use uh, Spark deep learning, which also I think depends on uh, tensor frames. Um, it has three steps. You save the model uh, as a um, static graph, basically you save the whole session. Then you load it back in Scala in your production environments and register the function, the graph, as a uh, UDF. And then you use it uh, like a regular SQL query uh, uh, with uh, how a regular SQL query work with your UDF. I'm gonna show you a little more details uh, in a bit. Okay, let's jump to demo. So this is a very long notebook, so I'm gonna, I already hit a lot of the cells um, just to avoid uh, distraction. But basically we have a lot of case classes, some helper methods. As I mentioned earlier, we rely on Scala and Spark to do tokenization. Um, so you load the data, you do tech, uh, data pre-processing where you do like um, the tokenization, filtering, et cetera, stop words removal. Um, oh, one, one nice thing about it is that you you can fit both uh, Python and Scala code in the same notebook um, by adding this nice percentile uh, Scala right here. So this by default is a Python notebook. So now I'm 
because I loaded everything from Scala, I'm, I need to transition to, to Python. This is how we do it. Do it. We basically create a temporary view um, here um, so that in Python you can do a SQL query out of the temporary view and you can go from there. Um, let's see. Okay, so here is your uh, first layer, the input layer of your neural network. And one thing I want to mention is uh, right now TensorFrame does not support more than one input variables. So you kind of need to pack all the metadata and so forth into your inputs, which is hopefully going to get better over time. And this is the recurrent neural network architecture. Uh, you have your forward layer and backward layer. You could choose to um, let your forward and backward uh, layer, sorry, networks to share um, parameters by using essentially the same cell. That also, that reduce your number of parameters by half and um, may or may not help your model performance. And this is, this is the softmax pooling layer, just to, wanted to show you the high level structure. Um, but this is really the meat of the problem. We, we, do, we call this nice tensor frame um, strip and freeze on tail function um, to basically save, save out your session into a um, static graph. You can save it anywhere you like. Uh, it could be on S3, it could be on your local disk. And then you load, uh, you load the, um, the um, graph from your disk and register is at it as a user different function right here. So this is just an example of some uh, text. Uh, we're we're, we're going to do a quick demo uh, in a minute. So again, we do a lot of text pre-processing here. Uh, I, this is everything still in Scala using our existing pipeline, so there's nothing new here. Um, what's interesting is here, um, we kind of try to append sh some shape information to guide TensorFrame uh, in terms of the shape of your input. In this case, it's, um, we said our maximum sequence length is 250, and the one is because we have some other metadata that we're going to unpack after. So this is the scoring part. Um, as I showed in the slides, you call like a, the, the UDF like you would normally. And you do some, uh, some post-processing to make it nice and pretty. So I'm gonna jump, oh, by the way, this is um, scoring the same text using our, our um, previous model, the SparkML model. And I wanna do a quick comparison. It's interesting because um, if you look at these two sentences, the second one, is contained by the first one. However, if you do um, a, a logistic regression model, it's gonna say, yes, it's about scheduling in one case, but once you add in a little more noise, the model kind of breaks, breaks down. But the recurrent network kind of um, handled that pretty well. So this is, this is one of the things that Leslie mentioned earlier. It, when you have noises, how, how does your model generalize? Because we, we are, by the end, uh, in the end, at the end of the day, limited by our training data. The second test case is sort of uh, also interesting. It's, it speaks to the variation, how well your model generalized. Uh, these are four different ways of saying, essentially, can we meet tomorrow? Can we have a meeting tomorrow? And again, um, with logistic regression, in this particular case, uh, of course, you can try SVM, et cetera. Um, in this case, uh, it handles two cases well, Another two cases kind of fall apart. Can we plan a meeting tomorrow? Can we organize a meeting tomorrow? And, and uh, on the other hand, the, uh, the recurrent network kind of uh, was able to generalize. I think this is largely due to the benefits from the glove uh, vector we have uh, uh, in, the, in the model. So that's our demo. So we kind of um, learn a few things. One of them is you can mix and match uh, Python Scala code in your notebook quite nicely. And uh, I think if you don't want to uh, change your infrastructure um, just by using TensorFrame as an interface, you can deploy a uh, recurrent network model or any other TensorFlow model um, in your Spark streaming environments. So with that, let's go to lunch or questions.
If you would like to ask a question, please come up to the mic here in the center. Seems a lot of people want to go to lunch as well. Hello. Actually, I have a question. Hi. Yes. So, uh, is the demo you just showed us available? Are you going to post online? Um, we don't have plans yet. I mean, we can think about that. Yeah. I mean, you've seen some of the code already, right? I mean, underneath, they are like loading data and there's a lot of kind of proprietary stuff underneath. So, we will have to kind of like extract uh, pieces. Yeah. We could probably do it if we extract pieces. Thank you. Uh, yeah. yeah. So we're also using a, a send notebook essentially for scoring. So we're also doing the pre-processing in Python in, in, in Scala, and then using essentially the notebook and doing all the training using essentially uh, Python TensorFlow. We've done it on large machines for that particular one. Yeah. Uh. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Apparently, there's okay. There's a mic over there. Thank you. Uh, so the question is, uh, when Alexis was talking about engrams, he said that there is a limitation uh, with the vocabulary. So uh, introducing a uh, more complex model, how do you actually surpass this limitation? I couldn't see that. If you could clarify that, it would be nice. Yeah. yeah. So if you look at the problem with engrams, is that we were generating up to three grams, right? Because there's an explosion if you go really higher. And again, one of the problem is that, first of all, when you generate a three gram, it's still a, a relatively small sequence uh, when you look at um, expressing for instance, scheduling request. And then you still have the problem that, again, you have, you have an unordered sequence of n-grams. And it doesn't really allow you to structure you know, a sentence you know, really well. So in the case of RNN, you will li literally do a time series of tokens. And then in addition, there's a th third dimension where each token has a word embedding related to that particular token, which allows also for like generalization. For instance, in the case of setting up, arranging, scheduling, is going to be a capable of going above and beyond you know, what you have in the, in the training data. Yeah, and just to add one more thing, uh, we benefited from a pre-trained uh, glove embedding, uh, trained based on the Wikipedia corpus. That really helps. Yeah. But still, your target values in your LSTM are from your vocabulary, right, anyways? So, so we have our own. So, training. what you have in your uh, email corpora? So. Yeah. So we have our own training data. So we have like consent data. There are a lot of rules for us for go, that go in data. So we have essentially some training data that has been labeled. We use Glove because we don't have global consent to use enough data from enough customers. So, uh, yeah. You showed us how you use this model for scoring. Uh, how do you train it? The training, oh, I'm sorry, I kind of skip over that. Um, so the training, you would do the training exactly the same way you do, do it on an uh, IPython notebook using TensorFlow. You can set up the structure and just, just do like a back propagation using your favorite uh, sort of solver. So you're training it also on, on Spark using uh, TensorFrames? Uh, no, no, I mean we're using, using TensorFlow, essentially doing a, on, in a notebook, Python and TensorFlow. Right, everything, uh, you know, you can think of it as TensorFlow all the way to the model, and then, then from there, the TensorFrame part would take over. But before that, everything is just normal TensorFlow workflow. Thank you. Uh, hello. Uh, hello, thanks for the great talk. Uh, I have two questions. Um, what kind of accuracy rates are you getting with your NLP? Sorry, so you want to know the accuracy of the model? Yeah. So we, uh, I don't want to share necessarily specific numbers, but all the model we have in production, we are looking at uh, optimizing for precision initially over recall because we want a good user experience, and then there are mechanisms to improve model over time. But I can tell you that for the same precision, switching from you know the ML model to the deep learning, we got a boost of over 10, a little bit over 10 percent for the recall. So the reason I'm asking on deep learning, I think on deep learning itself, I've heard something like 76 to 80 percent is the best what I've seen from Stanford's and research yeah. papers. So typically for us, we're training the model to have you know 75 percent plus on the precision okay. on the test set, okay. uh, and then we kind of like adjust you know recall accordingly. 
Then, of course, the challenge is that when you look at production data, it might be different, and those things might not generate as, as well. And this is where, actually, the uh, TensorFlow model using, again, uh, world embedding does significantly better, because it can generate above, generalize above and beyond you know, the training data we have. Thank you. Uh, one last question. So I know MetaMind got acquired, yep. right? Is some of the work similar to what? That's right. So we're working very capable? closely with uh, MetaMind team, essentially. So for research, we are located in Palo Alto, uh, essentially. So we've been uh, working with them. OK. Awesome. Thank you. It's also one of the reasons why we're using Glove. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> hey, um, you mentioned that your sequences, I think, were like uh, trimmed at link 250. And then you mentioned a dynamic RNN. Is that basically to handle like statefulness so that it doesn't wipe out the weights in between? Like if, if you had a sentence of length 500, obviously you're cutting it into two pieces. Is that basically? So, so yeah, so um, we generally try not to do sequences that are too long. So we have a limit. However, like you already pointed out, if the critical information is in the second half of the email, you don't want to miss it. So there are many ways you can, uh, like we also consider uh, doing uh, to handle that. One of them is uh, to train and score on a sentence or paragraph level to essentially break down the, the documents. Uh, on the dynamic RN, it, I think the idea is there is that you have, uh, you have uh, sequences that are, that are, some of the sequences are um, 100 tokens, some of them are 10. So you want your network to read exactly the number of real tokens, nothing more, right? So, but what I found is if you keep reading, if you let the network go, uh, let's say you don't limit it, let's say I have a, a sentence of 10 tokens, but you want it, you run the network for, for a 100 tokens, 100 uh, time steps, what you're gonna get is a bunch of, the output will be meaningless because they're all essentially triggered by, by, by your padding. And that's what the dynamic RN is trying to, okay. to, to solve. So it's kind of like masking, basically, you're telling it to stop. Right. When you see a padding, stop. Like, right. Okay. Oh, yeah, you need to actually, the cost, you, the price you pay, you manually tell the network how long each sequence is prior to, that's one of the metadata we pass in, um, so that in those, I need to stop after 10 time steps, for example. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Uh, hi. So I have a question about how much label data you work with, because it's a deep, I mean, it's a deep neural network which takes a lot of data, but right. the kind of output that you generated has a call to action saying that, that there should be a meeting schedule. I, I was confused how you generated label data. That too in so much quantity. How did we generate your training data? How much? What was the question? Sorry, what? what, what can you repeat the question again? Uh, I was curious about how you generated so much label data that you could Got use you. with. So we, have, so, for, so we have a lot of constraints as far as what data we can get. So we essentially have user consent. Then we have tools for anonymizing data. We have our own tool for labeling data. And we have our own set of people for labeling data, basically. And how, how much data was it that the network trained on? So we typically do 10,000 plus for emails, right, per you know, uh, model. Yeah. OK, cool. Yeah. Thank you. And again, this is where you know, world embeddings are very interesting because they generally are better, right? If you use traditional NLP, that kind of scale is typically not sufficient, but you know, using a world embedding or LSTM, you can get a really good performance with a relatively small amount of training data. Actually, it was a good lead up to my question, was just, uh, just to ask about any metrics you could share on your just runtime and hardware that you're using. So, what we're using for runtime? For training, yeah. Training. For training, so yes. we use basically, you know, we own like, uh, we're using an EC2, you know, GPU, basically instances. Okay. Yeah, for scoring, I think we can, we were using CPUs? CPUs. Uh, for scoring, actually, for now, the testing we've done was actually in CPU. It's clearly slower than the uh, ML model we have, right? But it's also more performant. Uh, and right now, actually, with, you know, the current implementation of TensorFrame, they have limitation to CPU, and they're gonna add GPU. Uh, for the scoring, uh, because right now, by configuration, the TensorFrame, which is essentially an abstraction of TensorFlow API, you know, through GNI, right, and they do serialization, they only have configuration of CPU, but this is something they're going to add. But from our standpoint, if we can score with CPU, because we already have EMR clusters with CPU, and we're doing, we're running a bunch of stuff, it, 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 the performance looks acceptable. There's still room for improvement, but it looks acceptable. Okay, thank you. 
Hi, uh, my question is how can you handle the engrams or um, phrases word when using the graph to feature in the model? Sorry, could you repeat the question? Oh, Sorry. because uh, the graph pitching the model is seems like designed for the unigram, right? How do you handle when when you have uh, some n-gram test, for example, New York, something like that? There, there, there's echo. I'm sorry. Um, we can probably talk after. I think the oh, microphone is. Um, so basically, uh, for the Spark part, uh, it's uh, um, it's running on the CPUs only, right? So for the so Spark, Spark, right? So for the so for the so we have a pipe. So all those models run in a streaming pipeline. Yeah. Uh, so we're actually using structured streaming. So for now, we're going to do the execution of the screen of CPU, but okay. then we're training on GPU. Oh, so model building is on GPU, but right. and the model only for scoring is on CPU. Yeah. And okay. the model building is essentially separate because we're essentially using TensorFlow and GPU for that, and we're preparing the data before, essentially. Okay, thank you. Preparing the training data. Uh, Are we given the signal that we should? Yeah. Okay. So maybe last question. One question. So, um, are you guys using any Trident uh, mixing uh, LSTM? Sorry, GRUs. So two things. Have you tried with GRUs? Did you get better results versus LSTMs? Um, are you asking which one is better? Or? No. Which one? Yeah, have you experimented with GRUs for for your models? Um, yes. Um, we on first try, I didn't uh, see too much difference okay. for our use case. So we kind of just stuck to one. But like I said earlier, I think I always have a trouble with knowing when to stop. Because to me, there's always many more things to try for. For instance, okay. what if I introduce some of the things I did with LSTM cells, with GRU cell, what would that do? Um, yeah, that's, that's okay. something. Yeah. The second thing, have you tried a mix of adding uh, reinforcement learning to, is yeah. there some research into using uh, or NLP using um, LSTMs and reinforcement learning together? Not yet. No, okay. no. Thank I mean, you. It's difficult in that case, right? I mean, we, we, we can't just generate data, but we're getting feedback data that we're incorporating over time. Sorry? We're getting feedback data from users that we're essentially incorporating over time. Users can give us feedback into the app, essentially, and tell us thumbs up, thumbs down on a given prediction. OK. So, so you're getting, are you using that real-time feedback into your model? Not in real time, but we're using that to eventually improve models over time. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Great, thank you.